Acts chapter 2, and we're going to pick up a phrase there from Brother Luke's record in what we call verse 11. Of course, we're all familiar with the uh, record that we call Acts. It's where our brother picks up his record. That's what we call the second half of his record, the first one being the record of everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after that through the Holy Spirit he had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he had shown himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them for 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's what we're here to do. That's what we love. That's what we want to hear about. We're not content with churchy things, with churchianity as I call it. Not so. We want to hear kingdom things. We want to hear about the rule and the working of God in his people from eternity. These things that he has has established and intended to work to draw out from the earth a people for his name, to make them stand, to establish them, to make them strong to where we can, so to speak, when we enter into his presence, hit the ground running because there will be much more to do. He's prepared much for us to do. We're, We're beginning to give ourselves to those things now. So he spoke of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, being assembled together with them, he commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Now, the brothers already this morning have spoken about how this, uh, these things came from God. God himself was working in these things. God himself was working in these things. So he, he, he said, ye have heard of me. So the master had been speaking to his disciples for uh, some time. Of this. He'd been, he'd been with them for 40 days. Of course, he'd spoken to them about these things uh, all through his ministry, and they began to pick up on these things and to, so to speak, gain, gain their footing and gain speed as they continued forward in these things. And, and uh, uh, of course, they were frightful in some things because there, there were things that were, uh, they were passing through things, very, very deep things, very difficult things uh, over which they had uh, nothing they could do. They were just swept along by these things, like, like our brother Peter when he denied the Lord. He was just swept along. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to at all. He was ready to put his hand to the sword and strike with it. Uh, Thomas, months before, weeks before, weeks before, had said, let us go with him that we too may die when they went to Bethany for the raising of Lazarus, you remember. So they were devoted to him. They didn't, they didn't intend for these things to, to be hiding as they did during those days after, after his uh, crucifixion, hiding together in the room when the Lord appeared to them, fearful. They didn't intend that at all. They wanted to be uh, busy with the work. They wanted to be with him. They wanted to engage these things with him. And at this time, they, were, they did those very things when he told them to wait. That's what they did. In, they waited in anticipation of this promise which he had said to them, ye have heard of me. So they turned their hearts in union, waiting. And at the appointed time, heaven stretched forth its hand. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. When this was noised abroad, you know, this, this, this sound yeah. w- without any physical expression. A sa- it was an otherworldly thing yeah. that drew these devout men to this location. God draws men to himself, literally did this. He drew the audience together. Yeah. Nobody had to raise any money for traveling expenses. Okay, wait on any schedules to be transported anywhere. God doesn't need such things. He drew the audience together to the place where these prepared and chosen and committed witnesses were there and ready and prepared by him, willing. Yeah, they were willing. They were glad. They were yielded. They were prepared as much as they could prepare. And then God uh, asserted his hand and worked in them that which was pleasing to them. And so all of these were confounded, this audience. We're talking about the audience here now. My text comes from the mouth of the audience, not from the mouth of the speakers. 
You're familiar with this. Saying to one another, Behold, are, are, are not all these which speak Galileans, we, how we hear every, every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? And we have a list of these. What is it, 12 or 13, 14, 16, 17 different dialects, languages? Jews, proselytes, Cretans, and Arabs. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Doesn't that, that's almost like the, the lyrics to a song, isn't it? That phrase is. It has a melodious sound to it to me. I thought the, the, the time that I've spent in this for the last several months thinking about these things, it, it, it's begun to, to get more of a, a melody to it. Just that phrase, the wonderful works of God. They were all amazed, were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? This is the audience now. Devout men from every nation under heaven. This is the only text of scripture that uses this phrase in these exact words. The wonderful works of God. And for those of us who are familiar with the record, the accounts of God's working in the earth, it brings to mind a multitude. Sister Debbie bought me a, a picture some time ago of a father uh, setting sitting on the couch with his children, reading to them from the scripture. And in the background of this picture, some of you have seen it on our wall, of course, are figures and, and images from the scripture, a multitude of them. So when I, I think of this phrase, the wonderful works of God, those are the kinds of things that come to my mind. The wonderful works of God. Over all of these wonderful works, our God sits as king, as Brother Paul said, who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. And his thunderous voice through the prophet speaks. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, Amen. and I will do all my pleasure. Yeah. Amen. Now, brethren, this is not just God imposing because he's strong and powerful, which he is, because he's mighty, which he is. He knows, he purposes, he executes, he fully develops and then completes and uses the circumstances that he brought to pass. Amen. And he engages the, all of this together then as instruments of his pleasure, as he says, which is always righteous Amen. Amen. and good yes. and holy, yes. not according to the standards of men but according to his nature. Amen. So, God prepared in advance then this audience in Jerusalem to hear. He made them a nation from this couple beyond the age of childbearing to whom the promise was made. He worked revealing to them a portion here and a portion there as the Spirit says he spoke to the fathers through the prophets at various times, various ways a great redemption that he was going to bring about. And he pictured for them ahead of time, your descendants shall go down into Egypt. He said to Brother Abraham there in Genesis 15, 400 years and I shall bring them out. Great redemption, Amen. An iron furnace, Egyptian power and wealth and culture. And then God at the time that he chose, in the manner that he chose, not according to human culture and society, not according to military power, economic circumstances, social uh, upheaval, none of that, none of that. God simply sent his prophet into the court of Pharaoh. By the way, the prophet had come out of Pharaoh's court, hadn't he? Who knew? Who knew? No one knew. No one knew what God was working. His mighty, his wonderful works. No one knew. Moses didn't know, did he? until God appointed him, and God sent him, and God directed him, and God uh, 
finished preparing his heart, you might say, and moved him to the place where he would then enter back into the court and command Pharaoh. As the Lord said to him, I will make you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. He focused his power on Egypt. God did. While Israel watched from Goshen, protected and provided for, not experiencing any things that the Egyptians, he made this distinction between his people and the people of Egypt. He totally dominated them with, with his, those who had great earthly power. He moved them at his will. Even when they refused, they moved. And they acted according to God's purpose, according to his will. He gave then Israel exclusive revelation of these things that pertain to himself. Because he'd already dominated the gods of Egypt. There was no God like him. None. He showed this. In their experience, they saw it with their eyes. They walked out of Egypt bearing the riches of the land. A place that had dominated them for centuries. And God simply, you might say, by the breath of his nostrils, blew them away. They, there was no competition. There was no challenge to God. There was simply God's timing in his way. You remember one of the uh, two, or three, two or three of the plagues, was it, that Moses said, okay, I will leave, and then I will say, and it will happen, that the, that the plague would end, so that he would know, so that Pharaoh would know. So there was no excuse, see, there was no excuse. God gave these convincing proofs, if you will. But, of course, he'd, he'd raised Pharaoh up as well, hadn't he, to show his power in that time, in that place. He gave great signs of his preference, his favor, his promise to Israel's father. See, this, this revelation was to Israel. It was not to Egypt. It was not to the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Girgashites. It was not to them. It was to his people, those whom he had chosen by his promises to their fathers. Great signs of his preference and favor affirming the promises he'd made to their fathers. And at Sinai, he terrified them, brought them to himself and terrified them by the sights and the sounds of his revelatory presence. Thunder, lightning, thick clouds, trumpet blast, fire, smoke, the ground shaking, the mountain melting when he simply touched his foot to it. He exhorted them to faithfulness in all of this, faithfulness to himself, instilling the fear of himself in them, making, making them promises for good and for ill. And they knew, they already knew, after this short period of time, God keeps his promises. Amen. Don't try to make deals with God. Don't try to manipulate God to get what you want. Don't you dare. They didn't learn that. We have. He extracted, in this terror, God extracted. You might say, I'm, I'm comfortable with using the word extracted. <laughs> he extracted promises from them. There was only a few of them who had willing hearts, you see. The rest of them simply were terrified. So God extracted this promise for them. So that later then, he would say, you promised me. You were not faithful to your promise. By the way, which promises they made faded in days, didn't they? Forty days. Make for us gods. See. He made them promises, of course. I've mentioned that. For good and for ill. Again, according, referencing the promises he'd made to the fathers. Which were all for good. See, the ultimate promises were all for good. The, the foundational promises were for his blessing. All the nations of the earth. Blessing those who blessed them, cursing those who cursed them. That's what they'd heard from their fathers. See. So here's the audience. They're in Jerusalem ready and prepared. Of course, 
He had also prepared the chosen witnesses. He sent John as the forerunner, preaching godly repentance with a, with a power that provoked his covenant people. They came from everywhere to hear this man, John, stirred up the people, especially prepared parents, John's parents, that is, especially prepared a godly culture of faith. Remember the prophecies that were given at John's circumcision? His godly father who hadn't spoken in nine months, first words out of his mouth, he shall be called John, according to the words the angel had said. And then he expounded that. John, of course, we know was separated from Israel's religious culture of sloth and mediocrity and fleshly privilege that they had developed themselves. That was evident in their leaders. And this is what John and Jesus dealt with. Sloth, mediocrity, and fleshly privilege in the name of religion. God revealed religion. That's what they dealt with. And Jesus drew these chosen witnesses out of and away from that culture. John didn't grow up in it, even though he could have. God separated him. He was not influenced by them. His message, when he came, shocked the elite religious culture, stunned them. Where did this man come from? Find out who he is. Where did he get these words? Where did he get these authorities? Where did he get this influence? Where did he get this power to speak these things? And so they sent investigating. And uh, John was, we might say, not cooperative. <laughs> he was not willing to give them the kind of answers that they were looking for. Of course, he didn't have the answers that they were looking for. He didn't answer to anybody except the one who sent him, Amen. did he? He stunned them by publicly demanding in the hearing of their own people that they give to God what they knew God expected from them, and yet they had refused. How dare he speak about such things to them? You wonder if any of those leaders knew who John really was, his dear godly father and mother. We don't know. There's no record of John ever speaking about it. So he didn't give them the kind of answers they were used to about genealogies, family connections, physical kinds of things. Well, I know so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so knows me and this and so forth. He didn't, no answers like that. John, his words were powerful, flaming with God's truth and light. He was rigid. He was irreconcilable and inconvertible to their ritual culture, which had in their, had, had repeatedly, apathetically violated God, generation after generation. They were not idolaters as their neighbors, as they had practiced in the past. But we remember the words of the Savior, don't we? Rightly did the prophet Isaiah say of you people, in vain do they worship me, their hearts are far from me. God had revealed to John a sign. See, the Father's hand was behind working, behind this, working in all of this. He had revealed that he himself would give a sign to clearly identify this one whom John knew that he was sent ahead of. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Raise up the valleys, bring down the mountains. He did know signs or wonders himself. His words are what plowed in the field of his audience's heart. Some for good and others for ill. He anointed John with this special communication that the divine agenda was right at the door. The kingdom of heaven is near, he would preach. 
John knew the sign. And when that one appeared, recognized it, and declared, this is the one. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. One in whom John already had high regard. Remember, I have need to be baptized by you. We don't know all those connections there in the background. Earthly witnesses. The father sent his son to the lost sheep of his house, the fullness of time. In word and deed he manifested. He himself, in himself, manifested God's grace and truth. He appeared to John, submitted himself to his message, and affirmed by that submission, the Lamb of God affirmed by his submission to John's message, this was God's prophet. This message came from God. He fulfilled all righteousness by the words of that prophet. He appeared to Israel, never left their land, didn't go to anyone else, spoke to another people. Nope. Unless, of course, they came to him, whether it be the Roman centurion, the Gentile woman, or the Greeks who came to Jesus came to Jerusalem, I'm sorry, and sought out Philip and Andrew. Sir, we would see Jesus. The, the, the power of his life was extending already to other places. Jesus spoke and lived in the sight of Israel, including their leaders, who had twisted the word of God for their personal convenience and profit, his life demonstrated God's righteousness as a, re as a reference point for them, for judgment. I am come into this world, he said toward the end of his ministry. For judgment, I've come into this world that they which might not, that they, that they which see not might see, that they which see might be made blind. The power for good and ill. He called the 12, these 12 to him. Those whom the powerful considered ignorant and unlearned men. He made them witnesses, sent them out to preach. They were drawn together to him through John, the two disciples, who then went and got others. He, sometimes he called them to himself, Philip. Jesus went and found Philip. Philip went and found Nathaniel. Jesus in Capernaum came through and found Matthew. Come, follow me. See, I drew these to himself. The others were not, were not sure, were not, were not informed of, of how he gathered the rest of them. But they were drawn to him. He kept them from the evil one. By his, his own godly life, and their closeness to him, the evil one would not approach him. Now, the demons that he cast out, none of them attempted to attack him. They were terrified at his presence. They trembled and pleaded to be sent someplace else. They were surprised. They didn't know. Oh, here he is, the Holy One of God. Jesus gave them divine power, the disciples, that is, to do the same thing, to cast out demons, power over sickness. He guided them personally guided them in the reality and revelation of his, his identity, his teaching, and his works. And he commissioned them as witnesses to go and make disciples, baptize, and teach all that he had commanded them. All of this together then demonstrating that the Father was in him, and he was in the Father. So now here we are in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. These had been waited as they were directed. They did what they were commanded to do. It was no burden to them. They had given everything. Well, months before, they'd said, well, Lord, we've, we've given up all to follow you. What is there for us? So they were confident he would keep his word. So they waited, and he fulfilled these things on the day of Pentecost. This power, this provision, this promise of the Father. 
came to pass. 800 years since Brother Joel spoke those words. No man knew. No man pointed to them until Peter, in his digest, summary digest of these things, said, this is that. God sent his spirit to work in a way that was unforeseen by any man. He granted them insight and understanding of his ways that were seen from a distance in the Law and the Prophets. But no one had understanding. No one had the understanding of those things until God granted the understanding. And this is what he's beginning to do. He intervened in this ordained religious event, the day of Pentecost, commanded for them to gather in Jerusalem. But God intervened in it, startling even devout men with signs and, and wonders in the natural order, provoking their faith, grabbing and holding their attention that this message could then, would then be delivered. His spirit entered and remained on these chosen witnesses in Jerusalem on Pentecost, empowering them as Jesus had promised. He gave them utterance to deliver this message that had never been heard. It had not been spoken to this time. What had really happened, our brother spoke about it this morning, the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God. This is what was really happening. God was working. Amen. And now here we've got the beginning of the exposition of it. It's being the beginning of, the, of it being expounded for understanding that men could then take hold of these things. God worked in these chosen witnesses. Don't forget the 120 now. They were there also. They fellowshiped in these things, in the waiting, in the anticipation, praying in obedience to and of their faith in the Savior. He drew the crowd to the disciples assembled in that place for the hearing of these things. He affected this sound. He gathered these men from all of these cities all over where he, had, he himself had scattered them. But now he gathers them together, this time in this manner, by his power, by his wisdom, a prepared crowd ready to listen to a prepared audience of God's mighty works. And they themselves confessed it out of their own mouths. The mighty, they recognized this, see? They were schooled in the scripture. They recognized this is a mighty work of God. The wonderful works of God. That's what they're speaking about. The witnesses affirmed That these things were not chance. They were not random. They were not incidental. Amen. Coincidence. God brought these things to pass. Scripture testifying that he had done these things. He enabled Peter to report this digest of the message. Mighty works. God's mighty works. The mighty works of God. The witnesses didn't manufacture these things. They weren't, these, they weren't that kind of men. They were not schooled in public speaking manipulation and attracting people. Not at all. They were common men who had been with Jesus, who could speak the truth plainly and were not afraid to speak the things that they had seen and heard. You know, they had stumbled. They had stumbled and hesitated and been afraid. They would not be so again, would they? Not so, yeah. They would continue to press forth. As for you, Peter and John would say, whether we should obey you rather than God, you decide we cannot but speak the things we've seen and heard. That was their first encounter with opposition. See, They were not going to back down again. They had been transformed, godly, devout men then. In their audience, devout men wanted to hear these things. Their eyes were opened. Their ears were opened to these things. And the fleshly taunts that were heard, uh, these men are drunken. Well, that just highlighted. No, it's not so. These are sober, weighty things. Yes. And everyone there recognized, uh, nobody, nobody paying attention to the taunters and the scoffers. And so they continued reporting the realities of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. That God had put Jesus among them in body, in Israel, 
their interaction with him was by God's agenda and wisdom. He directed the words and thoughts even of those who conspired to arrest him. Let me remind you that they had decided early in the week, not during the feast. Now we want him, but not during the feast, the people may riot, but they did arrest him during the feast, didn't they? Because it was time. It was time. You see, as has already been said today, in all of these matters, God's interests, God's pleasure, God's agenda is primary in all of these things. His word does not fall to the ground empty. It will accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. Brethren, we are the fruit of that, the continuing fruit. This working in us, it continues. His purpose of his truth and righteousness, peace and grace that are declared in the gospel of his own dear son. And then, during the reporting of these things, the audience spoke again. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Greatly convicted and weighed upon by these things that have, that have been spoken, these wonderful works of God. They were drawn to engage this truth. Convicting the hearers by the Spirit. Moving them to interrupt Peter at their conviction. Provoked in the faith that saves. And the obedience to and of faith that is common. The Apostle Paul would write about it later. But see, it happened long before he wrote it down, didn't it? We all know that God counseled these things, this purpose in himself before the world began. From the foundation of the world, he worked these things. He alone determined and knew this purpose in the creation, habitation, and revelation to the earth. Brother Al spoke about the Godhead having this counsel. But those things that the things we're talking about here have been counseled before that. They'd been determined before that, see. And his purpose and works, of course, are much more expansive than human interests or appetites or even human needs. It's not enough. I heard all my life about God providing for our needs, what we needed. We needed this, we needed that. You know what? That never was enough for me. Because I know my needs don't carry very much weight at all. They can be blown away by the wind, huh? We had that here three and a half years ago. The needs of a lot of people were blown away by the wind. There's got to be something more. And there is. There is. That's what anchors our soul in the presence of God. Not in this earth. Not in this community. Not in our families. Not in our jobs. Not in our health. But in the presence of God. We have an anchor for the soul and the wonderful works of God that he has done here in the earth. God has no pleasure, as we've heard also, brethren, no pleasure in death or the banishment of the sinner. He takes much pleasure in faith and repentance and godliness, and so he has provoked and provided this for himself in those who are willing of heart. He's declared his works finished from the foundation of the world. No do-overs, no backup plans, Amen. no surprise on what now, no back to the drawing board, none of that. Amen. He has worked his will and purpose, the mighty works of God, reconciling the world to himself. Brethren, I exhort you to believe them and be saved. God's grace and peace. Thank you, brethren.